Hi everyone, welcome to today, today's meetup. On today's agenda, Scott, Chris Pascagula, Chris Fox, and Walt will be discussing what's coming in the ArcGIS for local government uh, 2017 release. We'll also be talking about the upcoming events at the UC related to ArcGIS for local government. As a reminder, we'll be recording and posting this recording on meetups.com. And during the meetup, if you'd like to make comments or chat with other participants, then please use the chat panel. However, if you'd like to submit a question for the team to answer, then please submit it through the Q&A panel. With that said, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Scott. Thanks, Heather. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Today, we'd like to highlight for you some of the work we've been doing. Uh, this spring and ultimately what we'll be shipping next week in the June 2017 release. Um, so let me just start with a few slides to give you guys some context for the work we've been doing and then I'll turn it over to the team and let them really drill into some of the specific uh, implementation. So we're going to start with an overview of everything we're shipping in the June 2017 release. And uh, we plan on shipping all of this new content and the enhancements we're making to existing content ne early next week. Um, and then we'll wrap up with um, some activities and events we have going on at the UC and ultimately share with you some high level plans we have for the second half of this year. Um, and ultimately do that so you can start to give us feedback in terms of priority for your organization and ultimately any gaps you feel may be missing. So let me just start by saying everything we're going to share with you today on the 27th, June 2017 release is always documented on the solution site and the What's New page. And there's kind of two primary things we're going to talk about. One are a set of enhancements to existing solutions uh, that we're making and shipping in this release. And two, a whole new set of offerings. And what's kind of exciting for us is that actually this is the first release where we'll be including a whole host of new offerings for homelessness and the opiate epidemic and a whole will actually be introducing a whole new section on the solutions site for public health organizations so it's a real chance for us to kind of expand the current offerings we have in some new areas so let's just jump right in um, I'm going to start with just a quick overview of the enhancements some of the enhancements we've been making to existing offerings and then turn it over to Chris to talk about some of the new things we're working on um, but let me start with some work that we've been doing uh, to extend the crowdsourcing solutions. And we talked about this at a meetup earlier this spring, but in the June release, we'll actually be including a series of scripts that allow you guys to extend your crowdsourcing workflows and do things like send email notifications when reports are submitted, moderate content that's submitted through the crowdsourcing applications you have, and also generate kind of problem IDs or report IDs as well too. And so what you'll see with each of our crowdsourcing solution offerings, a whole new set of um, additional help topics that walk you through how you can configure these additional scripts to extend those workflows provided in the core apps. And as we mentioned at that meetup earlier this year, um, you know, we're just going to continue to grow and evolve this set of, of offerings to help you guys round out the crowdsourcing workflows in your organization. Um, another area we've been working actively on is uh, the community address and community parcel solution. So you'll see a whole suite of enhancements to the data assistant add-in for ArcGIS Pro that's used for those workflows. And while the primary focus of the data assistant add-in is actually these data aggregation patterns we talked about, what you'll notice if you dig in and take a look at that is it really is a very nice data loading tool that can be used for a whole variety of different workflows. Uh, at the same time, we've been um, getting some feedback and, and uh, enhancements to, from users of our 3D offering. So you'll see some enhancements to the shadow impact analysis and visibility assessment solutions. And ultimately, we've been going through and testing all of our solution offerings to ensure they work with ArcGIS Pro. And what you'll see with the add-ins we ship, there actually are versions that we'll provide for 1.3 and Pro, ArcGIS Pro 1.3 and 1.4 and ArcGIS Pro 2.0 as well. Um, so it'll support both versions of ArcGIS Pro that you have running in your organization. And finally, um, we've also been working very actively on a set of solution site documentation changes, um, just to really standardize the way we're documenting some of our key workflows and ultimately clean up and uh, make it easier for you to take the content we're providing 
uh, either in the deployment tool or um, through the manual configuration process and, and deploy it in your organization. And so we're constantly kind of evolving the documentation that goes along with the solutions to make it easier for you guys to adopt in your organization. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing now and turn it over to Chris Piscogli, who's going to go through some of the new offerings we have for land records and blight remediation, and then we'll just continue to work our way through that. So Chris, I'll stop sharing and I'll let you go ahead and get started. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, so uh, as Scott mentioned, we're making some updates to our land records offering as well as some new applications for blight remediation. So I'll talk about those today. So mainly for uh, land records, we have a new application called tax distribution and I'll demonstrate that today and talk about that. We've also made some enhancements to parcel drafter, mainly just making it part of the core product. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit and how you can actually deploy parcel drafter if you haven't done already. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you how that's a simplified process now. For blight remediation, we actually have two new applications, one called Demolition Tracker and another one called Mortgage Counseling Locator. So uh, without further ado, I'll just jump out and show you those. So uh, the first application I wanted to focus on is tax distribution, my tax distribution. And this is a web app builder application used by the general public to review and understand where their property tax dollars are being distributed. So it's a very simple app, again, Web App Builder. Um, if I click on a property or search for one, what I end up seeing is the uh, standard property characteristics that you might see with something like a tax parcel viewer, but also how the taxes are being distributed. And this is being displayed through a custom pop-up. Um, the nice thing about this application as well is that the content you're seeing displayed in this pop-up is really coming from a related table we're now shipping with our new tax parcel layer. So uh, it's very easy to load data. We actually looked at a variety of tax systems and uh, saw how those exports look like coming from those standard systems. And then the loading process is, is very simplified with this uh, additional table that we're now shipping with the tax parcel layer. So in this case, you're seeing a pop-up, you're seeing the grade school um, distribution all the way down to things like DuPage County Airport, right? So. It's a very simplified pop-up, um, custom pop-up that shows you that in a nice chart or graph. Um, that's my tax distribution. Now kind of switching gears from line records into our blight offerings. This is a new application called uh, Mortgage Counseling Locator. And this is really a web app builder app that's used by the general public again to locate mortgage or housing counselors in their community. So what you're seeing is um, uh, a very simple search on the left hand side or right hand side. I could also click on the map. Um, it buffers that location and then finds uh, counseling services around me. In this case, it found Habitat for Humanity, uh, DuPage uh, Homeownership Center, and then the Housing Advocate Advocacy Group. So if I click on one of those, I get more detailed information, um, their address, phone number, contact info, what languages are supported by the actual facility, um, what services are available, and then I can actually link out to uh, the actual web page for that, for that uh, counseling location. I can also get turn by turn directions. So if I click on the directions tab, it's gonna automatically uh, locate um, the, uh, the center that I selected and then find me the, the simplified instructions on how to get there. So that's mortgage counseling locator. Um, sticking with that blight theme, we also have a new application called demolition tracker. And again, this is another Web App Builder app, and this is also used by the general public to understand and track where demolitions are happening and also understand their financial impact on the community. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side is a listing of planned demolitions, contracted demolitions. So those are demolitions that, are, that have been contracted. So they've been put out to bid. A contractor um, has been chosen, and um, it's actually contracted, and then completed demolitions. If I click on any one of those, items, I get a listing of all of those, uh, in this case, contracted demos. And I can click on one, it brings up the pop-up, it shows me what neighborhood that it's in, the structure use, uh, contractor, in this case, ACES demolition, when it's scheduled to be dem uh, demolished, and then the quoted cost. And that's really showing you, you know, the quoted cost by the contractor. If I click on the completed demolitions, and I get a pop-up for one of those, you can actually see what the actual cost is. So now you can kind of compare, and it's, a, and it, and it's really to help um, citizens in the community understand, you know, not only where the demolitions are happening, where they're planned, but also how much they're actually costing um, to, to be dealt with. So that's Demolition Tracker. 
Um, what I'm going to do is I'll jump now back to line records for a second. I'll talk briefly about parcel drafter. Um, and we can answer any questions towards the talent of the presentation. But this application's already been um, uh, released. And what I really wanted to show here is how you can configure it simply um, in, in the June release. So what I have here is a simple web map. And it has the parcel drafter layer that we include with our solution offering. Um, and I've unpacked that and I've published that as a layer to ArcGIS Online. And now what I can do, which is really nice, is simply share my web map as a web app, choose web app builder, uh, give it a name. So in this case, I'm gonna call it parcel drafter. And I'll go ahead and get started. And if you don't know what parcel drafter is, it's really just a web app builder widget within web app builder that allows mapping technicians to actually enter meets and bounds descriptions uh, to check for closure and things like that before the recorded, but also after recordation. Um, so what I'm gonna do is actually go to the widget panel here and I'm gonna select a header control widget. And what you're gonna see uh, with the new release is Parcel Drafter actually listed as a default widget in Web App Builder. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. Um, I can set my parcel layer, which is parcel layer in the web map. Um, set all my Kogo information, which is automatically, a lot of these things are automatically being set by the widget. Um, and then I can choose my line types and type in, you know, if, if you want to type in information about the parcel name, plan name, and that kind of thing, you can get more detailed info in the help. Um, click OK. And after just a couple simple clicks, I can actually start a new Traverse directly in the app. So it's very simple to configure. Uh, it's just part of the core Web App Builder product now, so you don't have to download the developer edition, which was a requirement in, a previous, in the previous version, and you're ready to go. So that's, uh, that's Parcel Drafter. Um, so that's, that's, those are the applications I wanted to showcase today. And now I'm going to hand it off to Chris Fox, who's going to be talking about some new applications for tackling the uh, opioid epi epidemic. Actually, it's going to be Walt. I'm going to share my screen oh, with sorry, you. Walt. No problem. <laughs> uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what we're doing with the opioid epi epidemic as well. Um, many of you already know that the uh, opioid epidemic has um, been impacting communities, communities all around America. And... Um, so what we wanted to do is to produce a set of applications, maps, and apps that can be used by our customers to be able to communicate that information uh, to their constituents and within their communities. And so what we have done here is we've collected a series of maps and apps in four different uh, themes. We tried to focus on uh, education, prevention, treatment, and response as the areas that we are trying to address with these applications. I should mention that uh, these applications were developed with input from several of our customers around the country, including uh, the Tri-County Public Health Department in Colorado, the Oakland County Public Health Department in Michigan, Orange County Health in California, and Northern Kentucky uh, Health Department, as well as some public safety agencies. Uh, so what I want to do now is just show you a few of these apps and kind of give you an overview of what's, what's going on here. You'll notice when, you, when it gets released, you'll see this new opioid epidemic solution page which is part of the Health and Human Services Solution website that Scott mentioned earlier. As I scroll down the list here, you'll see quite a few of uh, these applications in each one of those four themes. The first one on the list is the Educate the Community. Uh, so I'm gonna pop into that app to see a little bit about what it's about. And as it, you can see here, it's telling me that the Opioid Awareness Maps is a configuration of RGS Pro. And it's used to be able to understand the extent of the opiate epidemic within a given community at a local level, and then be able to communicate that information out through the opiate awareness story maps. So let's just take a look at this pro configuration and see what this works, how this works and what it's all about. When you get it, you'll open it up and you'll notice that there'll be a series of tasks over here. I've docked them over here on the right side. The first one on the, the first task on the list here walks me through the process of publishing a new hosted feature layer in my organizational account using the opiate incident layers that are now available in the uh, ArcGIS for Local Government Service Catalog. So once I have hosted those and added them to my map, or I published them, I should say, uh, then I can go in and organize my source data that I want to use to populate uh, those new hosted feature layers. And there's two ways you can do that. One, you can come into this first, the first um, set here, and it asks you for the, uh, the data that you want to add to your map. So if I've got a published health services or, or um, incident service, I would add it to my map. 
And then you can add uh, the data to that. So I can select out what type of data I want to push into that hosted feature service, whether I want it to be an overdose layer like this one I have over here, or some deaths or naloxone nax reports or something else. I can also pick out things like dates and whatever else I'd, I'm interested in to put into that, to that layer. Uh, once that's done, then I can select that as my input layer. So I've got like, let's say a feature class here, and I want to push it out to populate a target data set, which is in ArcGIS, in my ArcGIS online account or in my enterprise account. And in this case, it's the overdoses that I have published earlier. So that's one way that you can do it. You can also pick, uh, pick from the list here, how do you want to do the schema matching? I can either make sure that the two databases match the, the, the field configurations match, or I can use the field mapper to reconcile the differences between them if I want to push them from one field to another. So that allows me to be able to populate or load data into my uh, new feature service. Another way you could do it, if you have data that's not geocoded, uh, such as a CSV file full of addresses, I could go through that same process, add that to my map, select out the information I want, geocode it, and then uh, load that data, the new geocoded data, into my feature service online. So once I've got that data loaded, the next thing I might want to do is be able to create these aggregate data reports. And so it asked me to select a reported area. And in this case, I could use council districts or a municipal boundary or something like that. And what I want to do here is I want to go through this process of selecting out specific types of, uh, of data. In this case, I might select out overdoses and I've got a uh, overdoses of females in 2016, perhaps, that I want to load in there. I would run that, and it's going to select out from my overdoses just those that match that criteria. And then I can go through this process, select my councils for the districts, and, and uh, go ahead and create those layers that I'm going to use later. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of that. I might have uh, uh, run through that process a couple times. In this case here, I have to create these overdose reports by council districts. I've selected out females and I want to compare uh, the difference in uh, female uh, drug overdoses to male overdoses within the same uh, districts. You could do the same thing for deaths if you wanted to. So in this case here, I'm selecting out deaths in 2016 under the age 25 uh, versus those over the age 25. And I could continue on and do more of those if I wish to. Uh, once you've done that, then the next task is to be able to share that information. So I've created these aggregate layers. I can organize them into groups and then publish those uh, to my organizational account. And once that information is done, then I can communicate that information uh, through the story map. And let me just show you a little example of what that story map looks like. We've created this configuration of the story map for the opioid awareness to be able to communicate information like I just created there out to the public. And you want to be able to communicate that information uh, for four different purposes, really. Is one is to educate the community about what's going on in, in your community. Uh, communicate, perhaps, any response activities that are already underway or planned. Uh, promote treatment and pain management alternatives. And also to reduce prescription drug use uh, within our community, so some prevention as well. So as I scroll down through here, you'll see a few things that are in this pre-configured story map that you can use. And one of them is a link that goes to the CDC, so you can get some information. In this case, it's a report on deaths um, uh, of over opioid deaths. And if I want to, I can uh, link out to that one. So it gives a perspective of what's going on in, in, around the country. And then we can get down to the more local level. In this case here, we have a link that goes out to the uh, lost loved ones stray map. If you haven't looked at that one, it's a good one to look at, but allows us to look at individuals across the country and in our own communities that have been lost to loved ones and allow us people to be able to share that information about somebody that they may have lost. So it's a good one for you to take a look at and a good one for you to communicate with your uh, community. Uh, but we can also educate uh, people about what's going on in our community by taking a look at some of those report maps that I showed you a minute ago. In this case here, we have those two maps that I showed you about deaths in 2016 over the age of 25 and under the age of 25. And we can kind of just kind of compare the differences within each jurisdictional uh, a boundary. Another part of our education is for those people that uh, overdosed but did not die from the from the drug and so we might want to see the trends that are going on between male and female as I showed you earlier and we can again compare them in, in individual districts if we wanted to. But this story map here can also be used by law enforcement to be able to communicate out to the public what's being done. 
um, how are we responding to that? And in this case here, we're, we're uh, sharing with the community how many lives have been saved by naloxone in 2015 versus 2016 using this uh, slider map over here. So we can see that there's been a change uh, in each of these districts over time. If you're not familiar with it, naloxone is uh, the generic name of the drug for uh, Narcan and Invisio uh, that is used by public um, uh, first responders. And it reverses, it temporarily reverses the effects of an opiate overdose. And so it's used all across the country. And it's good to be able to track that and see how that's being done at a local level. So that's another way to be able to educate the public. Uh, we can also have law enforcement or other people use it to communicate how they are engaging with the citizens in their community to be able to report on illegal drug activity. And this is just an example of one of the apps that's included in the suite that allows the community to come in here uh, report on any drug activity that they've witnessed. They can either indicate whether they would like to remain anonymous or if they would like to provide information and where the location of it was and submit an anonymous report if they wish. Um, and then another one is to be able to give communicate to, to, the, to the public that is uh, information about where they can go to get treatment. And this is helpful for not only uh, families of those that are addicted, but also for um, you know, public, public health officials and public safety officials and, uh, first responders and so on. Um, and then we can also provide information about how uh, we are gathering um, drugs off the street, unused or unwanted prescription drugs, and where they can go to be able to drop that information off and uh, communicate how much of it's been uh, collected in the last year. And you can see that uh, DEA sponsors a couple of uh, uh, times a year, uh, National Take Back Day, and last year they reported over 447 tons of drugs were taken off the street uh, using those pickup locations. So it's an important aspect of communicating with the, with the public what we're doing in our community, how we're participating in that national endeavor. Um, another one is promoting pain management alternatives. Uh, instead of going and get an opioid for your pain management, uh, there's ways that you can communicate to the public how they can go out and get some other information like rehab or PT or something like that. And then last, it provides information uh, to the public uh, where they can go to get additional information if they wish to. So that's a way for you to communicate the information that's being generated uh, from the opioid awareness maps. What I wanted to do now is just kind of go through real, real quickly some of the other apps that are included in here. You'll see that we have a track naloxone deployment. If I pop into that app, you'll see that here. Again, this would be used by first responders. Uh, where they can infer, enter into information that they have used to administer uh, naloxone to an overdose um, person and they can gather some information about what type of person it was and where it was and what happened and so on. Um, and this is useful to be able to track um, things like fentanyl uh, that are being um, cut, you know, heroin's being cut with fentanyl and it can have a devastating effect. It can be deadly actually. And so it's good to be able to track where that drug is being distributed and also uh, where the naloxone deployments are going and how much of it's being used. So it's one way for EMS to use it. Again, this is for internal purposes. Another application in the list here is the Drug Activity Reporter. You saw that earlier, uh, but there is a uh, manager that comes along with that as well as a dashboard. So once the public has used that uh, app, which is a configuration of Survey123 you saw earlier, to be able to communicate where uh, drug activity was, um, somebody uh, internally, uh, in law enforcement or someone else, can use the Drug Activity Manager to come in and assign that report to somebody on their staff to be able to follow up on that. And again, there's a dashboard that comes with this one as well. Um, another one on the list then is the measure the drug drop-off effectiveness. As I mentioned, that um, there's a national program and many communities across the country are participating in that. So uh, you wanna be able to, to communicate where um, someone can go to find a drug drop-off. And there's a locator app similar to what Chris showed earlier. Um, and this one has been configured to be able to show where those drug drop-off locations are and then be able to uh, locate that on the map. Um, once you've identified where that is at, you, um, you might want to be able to uh, gather information from each one of those drug drop-off points on how much uh, drugs they have collected. So if there's two days a year that the DEA is sponsored, you might want to measure it that way. So this application can be used internally by law enforcement agents or uh, some public safety people to be able to communicate um, where and add a comment here about how much drugs have been uh, collected at each one of these sites. Um, another one way to do that is to be able to generate reports. So you can click on each one of these individual locations 
And it brings up a little chart here that shows you how much been drugs have been uh, taken off the street at each one of those locations. So it allows you to tell whether you need to add additional locations or not. So that's a little bit about the uh, measuring drop, drop, drop off effectiveness. There's several applications that are included in with that one. Uh, the promote treatment options is very similar. Um, allows you to locate where, as you saw earlier, where you can find pain management or treatment facilities. This one is the health resource inventory. It's used internally to be able to qualify and add to the map uh, those locations in each one of those categories. And in this case here, I've got a drug treatment facility and uh, we just added it to the map here and give it all the information uh, that would be associated to that. And there's several different categories of, uh, of um, resources that could be drug treatment, it could be a homeless service, it could be a mental health facility or so on. But again, this would be used internally to be able to keep track of what uh, services are available within a community and then communicate that back out through a locator app. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit about the promote uh, treatment options. And then finally, the last one on the list here is to be able to monitor what's going on you know, within a community uh, from an internal, internal perspective. So again, both, I'm um, just going to log in here again so we can see it. Uh, one of the things we might want to be able to do, excuse me here, uh, is to be able to track how are uh, all of these things being managed. You know, we have the drug activity reports and so on. And to do that, we can just kind of scroll through the list here on the panel at the bottom here, and we can see, all right, we have um, uh, an update on how many overdoses have occurred over the last 90 days versus the previous 90 days. So we can see if there's been any progress, and then we can uh, uh, search for or locate individual ones as we want to. Do the same thing uh, for deaths. We want to measure uh, progress. We kind of want to monitor where we're at with it, how, how, how have our programs uh, been succeeding or not. Again, back to the naloxone deployments, we want to be able to see where those deployments have been occurring and uh, we can do the same thing um, in the same time frames. Um, we might want to be able to search for drug seizures, kind of get an idea um, for how law enforcement has been able to seize drugs, get them off the street, as well as the um, um, drug activity reports that have been reported in through the uh, previous app that I showed you as well. So again, it's just ways for us to monitor activity. Uh, including the drug drop-offs, we can see how many pounds have been removed in the last 90 days versus the previous 90 days as well. So this kind of gives you an overview of all the maps and apps that are included in the uh, opioid solutions. Uh, but one of the common things is this is great, but that's an awful lot of apps. Well, the first thing you should know is you don't necessarily need to deploy them all, but you can deploy one or more of them. And the easiest way to do that is, again, I'm going to go back into my pro application. And in this case here, I'm just going to go up to my share tab and select on the ArcGIS uh, Solutions Deployment Tool. If you haven't heard about this one, it's a very good one. It's on our website. You can find it. Um, but it's a very good one to use, especially when you're deploying these solutions, these opiate solutions. And one of the things you want to be able to do is, uh, after I sign into my account, perhaps I want to clone them, but I want to be able to deploy these solutions into my organizational account so I don't have to create all these configurations from scratch. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to search for an opioid. And you can see on the list here, here's all the maps and apps that are part of that opioid solutions uh, collection. And the ones that are checked here on the green check mark are those that I've already deployed into my organization account. Um, so I know which ones I've done and which ones I haven't done. So again, it shows you an example of you can choose which ones are important to you and deploy them a little over time. When you do deploy these, you can choose to put them into an output folder in your root folder of, uh, of your uh, organizational account like this. And it will bring in not only the app, but also all of the um, maps that support each one of those apps, like I showed you earlier, and the services that are required to support them as well. So that is a very brief overview of all of the apps and how you can uh, deploy them into your organizational account. Uh, before I turn it over to Chris Fox to talk a little bit about the, um, the homeless apps that we've also added to it, I wanted to stop here, Heather, and see if we have any questions that we can answer regarding, regarding any of the things that we've shown so far. Uh, sure. Um, um, one person has uh, said, basically, uh, my background is in um, attacking business problems in the assessor slash public works planning perspective of uh, county government. 
and has always had trouble connecting to the HSA needs uh, and delivering meaningful solutions to them. Any strategic advice on how to adjust my thinking or better serve those health oriented stakeholders? Anybody want to take that question? You want me to take it, Walt? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so, I mean, break. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think the solutions that Walt showed are a great way to do that. Um, you know, we had a recent example of that at a health department, right? We, rather than sitting down and talking generically about how ArcGIS can help um, that agency, we went right in and showed them the opiate solutions and in particular kind of walked through that construct that Walt talked about where you can first kind of use the data you have to understand the extent of the problem and then ultimately once you understand whether you have a problem, you can then begin to kind of respond to it. So I think one of the things you'll see with the um, demonstrations that Walt and Chris ultimately will show you is that you're now, we're now arming you with a set of solutions that you can take to the health departments in your community and show them how ArcGIS can add value immediately. Um, and certainly opiates and homelessness are top two of the probably largest top of mind topics that we're seeing in the health community right now. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and this, even though we're kind of focused on opiate drugs, there's no reason why some of those other, those solutions couldn't be applied to other, um, you know, drug-related problems in the community as well, too. There's nothing precluding them from that, per se. It's just they are very focused on the response requirements necessary to deal with the opiate epidemic. So I guess that's what I would suggest, is you, you can now use the solutions as kind of a window in. Um, and in many cases, as Walt mentioned, you can also kind of go, uh, you know, one thing we're finding with opiates is it really typically is a multi-agency response activity, right? There's some things that are going on in the police department, there are some things going on in the fire department or EMS more specifically, and then some things going on with health. And so you'll have an opportunity to kind of reach out to all those agencies with these offerings in particular. And I'll add to that, Heather, I'm not sure, but I thought mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, this organization, the Substance Abuse and Mental mm -hmm. Health. I believe there was an acronym, but I'm not sure. And yeah. I wanted to say, yes, this is a very important HSA, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, and it is included, uh, we have a reference to that in that story map, but it is, we've used some of the information from the, this organization in the, the treatment locations and the type of locations and what services they offer. Yep. So hopefully that will help you. Okay. Um, another question is, will these maps and apps be available for portal users? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so everything that we're showing will be available in ArcGIS Enterprise 10.5 mm -hmm. and 10.5.1. So. Heather, I, I want to clarify. Um, sure. Because, because many of these solutions, um, we have it, I'm going to talk a little bit about it later. We're leveraging the new hosted feature layer views in oh, yes. ArcGIS Online uh, to hosted feature layer views if you haven't worked with them they're they're pretty powerful in that you can um you can control individual editing access to the layer but they're ultimately um, referencing the same underlying source so we can have these public apps that are built off of a public view that has editing restricted and it's only read only but they're referencing the same service that's used internally to edit and add features and we're using views to support that um, Enterprise 10.5.1 doesn't support hosted views yet. Uh, they're hopeful that it will make it into the next release, and if it is, then we'll be able to support them on Portal. So in terms of the automated deployment uh, that Walt showed you from the deployment tool in Pro, they won't work with Portal yet. You could certainly stand up these apps in Portal and not use the views um, that we describe in the, the manual steps, um, but the automated uh, approach isn't supported in portal yet for that reason. And also survey one, two, three as well, correct? The survey one, two, three apps. They're only you can, supported in online? No, you can you can publish to portal from survey one, two, three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Were there other questions, Heather, regarding the opioid stuff? No, that was it. All right. Well I will stop sharing and allow you to take over Chris for the homeless stuff. Great. Thanks, Walt. All right. So um, in regards to the homeless 
NIST solutions. Um, we wanted to provide a set of solutions that public health agencies and other engaged organizations in the community could use to reduce homelessness in the community. Um, the first solution that I want to talk about is the homeless point in time counts uh, application. If we go to the solution website, uh, very similar to what Walt showed earlier, we have a new reduce homelessness section and we have a, our um, apps that are targeted at uh, health and human services agencies uh, to, to deploy in their organization to respond to homelessness. The homeless point in time counts is a configuration of survey one, two, three for ArcGIS. Uh, that can be used by health and human service ag agencies as well as volunteers in the community to conduct a sheltered and unsheltered homeless survey. So the Department of Housing and Urban Development or the HUD requires that continuum of care communities conduct the annual count of homeless sheltered persons. Uh, these are people who are staying in an emergency shelter, transitional housing or safe havens. They also require that they do a count of unsheltered homeless persons, people who are sleeping on the street or in a park or in abandoned building. They require that they do that count every other year, generally falling on uh, the odd year. And they conduct these surveys on typically a single night in January. Um, they do it in January because in northern uh, states, it's often the coldest time. So um, you, you're hopeful that the majority of people are staying in shelters at that point. But if they're not, that's a, that's a serious concern to be worried about. But that gives them a sense of how many homeless uh, individuals and families are in the community. And if we go to the HUD's website, they actually provide some model surveys that they, based on their experience, best practices, input from leading survey and homeless methodology experts have built these example surveys uh, that many communities are using today to um, do this count. So if we take a look at one of them, let's first take a look at the sheltered night of count survey. So it's a PDF form that can be used to do that sheltered survey. And there's um, it's very familiar experience asking questions based on certain response. You might skip ahead to other questions or uh, ask an additional follow-up question. So this paper form has been used by a lot of communities, and then there's that translation to, to move it to a digital format. So we wanted to create a um, configuration of Survey123 that could encapsulate all of this information, as well as combine the sheltered survey and the unsheltered survey into a single um, survey form. And we can use answers to specific questions to um, adjust the flow of the survey and expose new questions or hide other questions based on the responses. So I think to demo this one, it's best seen in the Survey123 app. Um, so here I am on my phone, uh, I have my homeless count survey. What's nice about this is this is a good experience if I was going to be going out in the field, going to a shelter or going um, and performing my unsheltered survey. I'm going to collect a new result or collect a new survey. It defaults to the current time. I can enter my name as the surveyor. And then it asks me some questions here. So is the person in a shelter? So this is the first question that changes the flow of the survey, whether I'm performing the sheltered survey or the unsheltered survey. I'm gonna, if I say I am in a shelter, it exposes some additional questions such as, what is the name of the shelter and what's the type of shelter? So I'm gonna say, no, I'm actually doing the unsheltered survey. Are you able to survey the person? So. In some scenarios, you might see the person off in the distance. They might be difficult to get to because of where they're staying. So you might not be able to actually get to the person to interview them or, or ask them questions. Or you might not feel particularly safe or uh, because a lot of volunteers are gonna be going out and doing this survey, we're concerned for the safety of the volunteer and there may be scenarios where they don't feel comfortable going up and actually doing the interview. Uh, let's say in this case that I am able to do the survey. Now we have some prompting text, and this text is coming from the HUD and their recommendations of, of what information you should be asking them. So first we ask if it's, if it's okay if we have some of their time to actually perform the survey. 
Um, I'm going to say their response is yes. And then we ask if they've already been surveyed. So has somebody already talked to them? We don't want to have a duplicate count. Um, we don't want to ask them the same questions and have them in the system twice. Uh, so this person hasn't been asked these questions. Next, I'm going to ask them where they're sleeping. Um, so if they are sleeping in one of the locations that's deemed unsheltered, then we would continue on with the unsheltered survey. But if they're staying in one of those emergency shelters or transitional housing, and we just encountered them on the street, we don't want to count them as an unsheltered person. So I'm going to select that they're sleeping on the street or sidewalk. <clears throat> so the next set of questions, we're getting a little more information about them and their household. Uh, as we do in the HUD survey, uh, you ask them how many adults are staying as part of their household or are sleeping in the same location as them, as well as how many children. And these questions trigger how many repeat questions we need to ask. So if you look at the household questions sections right now, there's not any additional questions. But as soon as I add one adult, you can see I have one of one that I'm going to ask. If I add another adult, now we have two um, related or repeat questions we have to ask one for the original respondent and one for the other adult in their household. Same with children, we're gonna add um, another related record there. So I'm just gonna go down to one. We ask the person's initials, um, go in there, A, B. How are you related to the first person? So in this case, we are person one, so it doesn't apply. Uh, are you staying in the same location? We can ask them how old they are. Are they Hispanic or Latino? What's their race, gender? Have they served? Are they a veteran? Um, so in this case, here's another flow question. If I say no, then we ask an additional question. Have they been called into active duty? And this is just following what the, the HUD has recommended in terms of the questions that should be asked. I'm gonna say no there. Is it their first time homeless? If they say no, then we're going to get additional questions. How many times have they been homeless in the, in the uh, past three years? This is an indication of chronic homelessness, which is something that the HUD is very interested in. If somebody has been homeless four or more times in the past three years, then they're considered chronically homeless. And that's, that's a concern. That's somebody that they want to um, try to work with to help them find more permanent housing. So I'm going to say it's the first time in this case. And... I've been homeless this time uh, for 30 days. Next set of questions are only int uh, intended for people 18 years or older, so that's why we get this note. If they were to enter the age of um, 17 or, or lower, they wouldn't even get these questions exposed. Uh, do you drink? Say no. Uh, no uh, psychiatric or physical disability. If any of those were answered yes, we get some additional options. Um, do you have any uh, receive special education, AIDS, or receive disability? I'll just fill, figure, uh, fill out the rest of these. The next, we can use our, our location, because if I was out there interviewing somebody, I would just use my current lo location. So let's just say we're in the park over here. And then once I finish that, I can thank them for answering the questions. If there are other people in the household, I would repeat and ask them the same questions. Otherwise, I submit it. I'm going to go ahead and send that now. So it collected that survey for me, and I could move on. Uh, if I was in a shelter to other people or the unsheltered, I could move on to, to find other households uh, that, were, that were sleeping on the streets or in an unsheltered location. So that's a really powerful survey that's taken uh, three PDFs that are all about five pages long and, and merged them into a single survey. And now I'm capturing that immediately in a digital format that I can use to get in more additional information about and submit back to the HUD uh, for aggregating that information. So to, to build on that, um, I could also fill out that survey on the web. Uh, so that you can do it from a, a web browser if you want to do that or the app. We have a dashboard configuration that exposes some of those key metrics uh, that were collected during the survey. So how many total homeless were found, uh, how many were unsheltered versus sheltered, 
how many adults, children, and veterans are some of the key stats, as well as was it their first time, and, and what is the average days uh, the person has been homeless that time uh, would be interesting numbers to know about the, the chronicness of the homelessness in the community. Another thing you get with Survey123 that's really nice uh, that you just get for free is the, the access to the analysis results. So I can go through and see percentages of what, per, what percent were in a shelter versus not, um, some of the different, the, a word cloud of the shelter programs, uh, a breakdown for people who are in the shelter, what type of shelter, um, whether we were actually able to survey them, all the questions broken down that I can see in a bar graph, a column. I can also look at a bar or a pie chart. I can also look at the results on a map uh, and they'll be symbolized by the type. Uh, so it's really powerful tool that you can really get to look at the results of the survey. You can see my, my new one just submitted there in Ann Arbor, but the majority of our results are over here in Naperville. Um, but it's a really powerful tool that you get just because you're using Survey123. The next application that I want to show is the Homeless Activity Reporter. So this is also a configuration of Survey123 uh, that's used by the general public to the general public and engaged in organizations to report the location of homeless individuals and encampments in the community. So whereas I just showed the homeless point in time counts solution, uh, which is intended to be conducted uh, by Health and Human Services and a volunteer at one night a year. This report can be used to get a better sense of homelessness in the community throughout the year. And it can also be used to, um, to accept this information and assign reports to internal staff or other volunteer organizations who can reach out to the individuals and families that are experiencing homelessness and help provide them services or aid uh, to either, if they're in an unsheltered location, getting them into a shelter or helping them find more permanent housing right away. So with this application, I, uh, I would typically experience this through the web client because I would make it available on my website for the general public to report. I can select the type of activity uh, give some details, add a photo if I wanted to, specify whether I wanted to be contact or not, and ultimately select the location. And when I submit that, now I have access to that in the Homeless Activity Manager. So now I have uh, five reports. I can select, let me zoom out a little here, select one of those reports. I can see the photo that was associated with that report, and then I can edit and assign that to uh, someone in the Health and Human Services and say that it's in progress and save that result. Uh, so this is a way I can kind of manage those things. And we also have a dashboard configuration that gives me uh, real-time stats on some of the open requests that have been submitted, the, the open reports. Um, and if there's a lot of open reports in a particular area, uh, maybe I want it, might want to get a volunteer organization involved or, or uh, have a campaign to go out to see if we can help provide more assistance to uh, the people that are uh, experiencing homelessness. The final application that I want to show is the homeless service locator. And this application is going to be very similar to some of the apps that we've shown earlier, where it's using a sense of location to find uh, facilities or services that are around that location. This one is targeted specifically at homeless services. Uh, so it's typically used by homeless and households at risk of becoming homeless to find local agencies who are offering services such as food assistance, emergency shelter, housing assistance, health services, or life and work skill training. Um, so what I can do is I can click on the map and it's gonna buffer the location and then show me all the facilities that are within that buffer and break it down by the service that's available. Many of these facilities offer more than one service, so they would fall uh, multiple times into these different categories. So if I look at housing assistance, I can look at two page pads and I can get information about that facility as well as get directions like uh, Chris showed earlier. 
Um, so that's the, the homeless service locator. Uh, the other way we can position this app and that we think it might be useful in the community is you can make it available to, to the general public to find opportunities in the community where they can donate their, their time, knowledge, or food and supplies to assist the homeless. So there's a lot of people who are interested in volunteering. They're just not sure where to go or, or how to get started. This app could be used to find facilities in the organization um, that, ought, that might be interested in having volunteers that can either come by to, to help serve food, or if they have some skills or experience, they could offer training, um, job services to help them build their resume and, and uh, find employment. So there's lots of opportunities that are available and this app can be used to, to highlight those opportunities in the community. So that's, the, that's a summary of the homeless solutions. The next thing I wanna do is take a little time to talk about enhancements to the ArcGIS Solutions Deployment Tool uh, that Walt showed uh, briefly there. So if you haven't used the Solutions Deployment Tool, it's an, it's an add-in for ArcGIS Pro. Um, this release, we're supporting, uh, in addition to 1.3 and 1.4, we'll also be supporting 2.0 with the add-in. Uh, and you'll have the, the ability to download the 2.0 specific add-in or the, the 1.3, 1.4 specific add-in and install the, the right one for your version. When you install the add-in, you'll get a new button on the Share tab called ArcGIS Solutions. When you click this, it's gonna load a new task into the project. I can sign into my organization and then ultimately deploy a solution. And what you're going to see is some of these new solutions that we've been showing during the presentation today. Uh, to, to support that, uh, the solutions deployment tool will now support Survey123 forms. Uh, so you can deploy a Survey123 form into your organization. It also, to support uh, a lot of the functionality that I described earlier in terms of hosted feature layer views, it will deploy those views into your organization as well uh, to really set it up so you can, you can keep editing access and access to certain fields in your data restricted while still exposing um, the, the information that is public and restricting and editing in a view of that service. The final enhancement that I wanted to talk about briefly is this new option called Add GPS meta Metadata Fields. So for many of our collector-based solutions, it's nice to be able to capture when you're capturing point features, capture additional information about the accuracy of and other details about uh, the GPS value that's collected at that location. So these metadata fields are added onto the feature layer and much like editor tracking, every time you edit that point feature in Collector, at either adding a new one or modifying an existing one, it'll write information about the, the GPS point and uh, other aspects of the device to that point so you have that information uh, persisted with that point feature. So you can just check this on, and when you deploy a Collector solution, it will have those metadata fields all ready to go and you can start leveraging them in the collector application. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over, turn it back to Scott uh, to, to talk about uh, some, some of the things we're working on at the UC this year. Hey Chris, before you um, leave, one of the questions we got um, is if you install the ArcGIS solution, if you have the solution deployment tool already installed, when you upgrade to Pro 2.0, will you have to update the add-in as well? And why don't you take that and kind of describe what that looks like? Yeah, so what you'll see um, if you go to 2.0 and you have the 1.3 or 4 uh, add-in installed, if you come back here in the add-in manager, you'll see um, the add-in grayed out with a little message here saying that the add-in targets version 1.3 and it's not supported at 2.0. So it will restrict that add-in from loading. You won't have that functionality available in 2.0 and you'll have to install a new version of the add-in. Uh, the reason for that is at, two, at Pro 2.0, they changed, they, they changed the API. So the 1.3 add-in would crash at 2.0 if it loaded, so they prevent 1.x add-ins from loading at 2.0 and that will continue to be the pattern when they release 3.0, 2.x add-ins won't load at 
So we'll just continue to support, you know, as far back as uh, we support, we'll provide add-ins that, that work at those versions. And then there was another question from uh, Elsa about, you know, is, I think they're at, she's asking, is the deployment tool only available in ArcGIS Pro or is it available in ArcMap? And the answer is ArcGIS Pro only. Um, we don't have any, we're not going to build a deployment tool for ArcMap. It's going to be an ArcGIS Pro thing. Yeah, there's there's reasons for it. You know, we're we're going forward with Pro, and Pro also has a nice experience for managing your portal connections and mm -hmm. setting the active portal or the organization that you're you're um, creating content in. So it's much more integrated with with online or ArcGIS Enterprise than ArcMap is. Uh, so right. that's one of the main benefits of that as well. And it's a great way to interact with the content that you then lay down yeah. with the solutions, right? The feature layers and up and wet maps and things like that. Yep. Yep. Okay. So Chris, I'll go ahead and share my screen and then we'll just wrap up and take any final questions you have. So we covered a lot today, but I just want to kind of summarize real quickly what's coming in the June release. Um, Chris showed you the homeless solutions. We talked about the uh, whole suite. It's actually nine different solutions and maybe 13 app configurations for the opiate epidemic and then some new offerings for land records uh, on the tax collection and a series of new offerings that continue to round out our blight remediation offerings. So those will all be new in the June release um, and we'll continue to involve them based on the feedback you give us in future um, and what we get with future engagements with customers as well too. Um, but the first release of them will be next week in the new June offering. Um, we've also got a whole series of enhancements that we talked about Probably the largest um, two in particular are the enhancements we're making to the crowdsourcing scripts and the new enhancements to the data assistant that's delivered with com community addresses and community parcels. So there's a lot of new content coming and a lot of things that you guys can take advantage of immediately in your organizations. Um, just to wrap up, um, you know, we're turning our attention now that the release is going out to the user conference. And if you're coming to the user conference this year, we actually have 10 different tech workshops. Uh, that'll be available. We'll cover everything from an overview of the solution as a whole, um, and we'll actually dive into maybe specific solution offerings around public works or land records. And then we've got 13 different demo theaters that'll typically take a specific deep dive into one or more of the solution offerings we have. And so I'd encourage you to kind of, you know, if you are interested in learning more, to kind of visit us at one of those tech workshops. On Wednesday, we've also got a special interest group um, that's available for local government. And we've got an area again in the ArcGIS X or the I'm sorry the Esri Expo area um, for the ArcGIS solutions, and we'll have a whole team of people there um, that can you know have more focused conversations with you and answer specific questions you have on either new solution offerings or any of the existing solution offerings we have. Um, if you're looking for those sessions, I would encourage you to either search for ArcGIS for Local Government. Um, and if you didn't notice, we actually uh, let me go ahead and get out of full screen mode here. We posted on the meetup site a, um, an overview of all the sessions. So there is a brochure out there that we shared on the meetup site and we can post it again on this meeting um, page that highlights all of the sessions we're talking about. Um, and so you'll see there's several on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, we've got some additional emergency management ones that you may be interested in and then a whole suite of demo theaters and the special interest group I referenced. And so like I said, this was posted on the Meetup site. We can share it again if you'd like, though. Um, but it's a great way to kind of find all of the specific sessions that are in the um, that are in the agenda as well. So let's just wrap up then with some final thoughts on kind of what we're thinking about after the UC. Um, and the primary reason for doing that is just so you guys can start to think about how these may align with the projects you're working on in your community. Um, so you'll see we're gonna to continue to grow and extend the public safety solutions. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about, uh, a lot more about community events and how we can do the operation and response activities associated with events. Um, Walt's been working on a suite of applications that help with public crime mapping and re response. Um, and then ultimately some simple applications for warming and cooling centers as well. In the public works space, we're thinking about uh, extending the Vision Zero solution offerings and kind of more holistically tackling mobility, which is some, something that uh, organizations, many cities and counties are starting to tackle as 
transportation concerns grow in their community. We're also looking at um, a whole suite of solution offerings surrounding the right-of-way permitting aspect, and then ultimately using that to drive enhancements to the road closure solution we have, and maybe even integrating that into the capital project planning solutions we have. So you can start to see holistically activity that's happening within the right-of-way. Um, Chris is actively working on uh, some new solution offerings around early warning, so we'll continue that work the second half of this year. Um, and be cycling with a whole suite of communities across uh, kind of the Midwest who are interested in that topic. Um, and finally, permit status and a new and improved public notification application. Um, so we are working on a kind of what I would call a 2.0 version of public notification that's running in web app builder, can be deployed in a completely hosted environment, and support many of the additional workflows you've been telling us about. And finally, one additional area we're going to tackle um, more holistically for an entire city is performance management. And so how can I start to, you know, years ago we did a, a solution called the Executive Dashboard, and that was designed for the mayor and cabinet level staff to track key performance indicators. We need to take a fresh look at that um, and not only address the specific needs of the mayor and cabinet members, but also look at other stakeholders like council members and the general public. And how do you provide a real engaging way for citizens in your community and other stakeholders to see how you're doing on key performance indicators in your community. Um, what you'll also see is we continue to uh, incorporate additional platform offerings. So we'll start to use open data as a way to deliver many of our public engagement uh, offerings, or just pro as a way to continue to enhance our data management and analysis offerings, and even starting to integrate workforce into some of our field mobility workflows that we've shown and insights to help extend your analytical workflow. So we're going to continue to incorporate many of the new capabilities that are in our JS and, and round out the solution offerings we have. So with that, um, I know we're right up against the time. If everyone's got a few extra minutes, we can certainly answer any questions that may have came in. Heather, or why don't you see, is there anything there in particular we need to address? Um, if anyone has any final comments or questions? Yep. Uh, one question is, are there are any of these solution or tool dependent on the presence of other software such as uh, Microsoft Excel or newer? Nope, not that I, no, I don't think so. Are they, Chris? Well, the only thing I would say is um, with Survey123, uh, they use, they use, XLSX forms as a way you author the survey. You can you can certainly um, you'll be able to either deploy the solution in the automated way or using the Survey One Two Three Connect app manually publish the survey without Excel. But if you need to modify the survey itself by adding new questions or changing the schema, then you need. Uh, you need some version of Excel. It could be even the free open Microsoft open uh, Excel to, to edit that file. Um, but yeah, you need to, to modify the survey. You would need that software. But yeah. Other than that, yep. I can't, can't really think of anything else that you would need. Yeah. The only other place maybe is um, if you are, you know, in the opiate awareness maps, if you know, the source of your death and overdose data is Excel spreadsheets. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, you don't even really need Excel in that case, but um, if you are going to modify what's in those layers, that might, might be one way to do it. But yeah, that's it's, it, it's, it, yeah, it's very helpful to have it um, right. if you're getting data that's giving to you in a CSV format. Right. Yeah. Um, and the final question, does the local government SIG is it's, are they going to provide lunch? Are we essentially going to ah. provide lunch? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> As of now, we do not have a sponsor for lunch, so bring bring a sandwich, bring something, bring a power bar. Maybe I'll run to Ralph's and grab a box of power bars for everyone. Um, but yeah, unfortunately not this year. Um, so bring bring something to eat with you okay. to be safe. Um, and Thomas is having trouble finding um, the UC flyer on the Meetup's website, so we can just post it on the, the home page of this yep. website meetup, I should say. <laughs> it should be under the, what is it, discussions, Heather, I think, or I, th I forget what it's called. But, yeah, yeah, discussions or pages, I believe, but we'll just post it on the, the main um, meetup website for this meetup so you can, you can access it there. So. Yep. 
Um, I believe that is it. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, so, yeah, thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing and hearing from you at the next meetup, which Scott just mentioned, on Wednesday, July 12th at the San Diego Convention Center. Um, it's in meeting room 29A. So, until then, everyone, have a great afternoon. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.